Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and having me here with you. Um, very exciting to hear some of the different ideas. Therapy, thank you very much. I was a jaundice baby as well. My mother was not allowed to hold me, and today she still won't pick me up. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm here to talk a little bit about some psychology, some understanding about who you are, who you're talking to. Right, I saw the breakdown when Michael asked, who's, you know, who's a founder here, who's looking for funding? We, of course, have our, our funders in the front. Anybody that wants to throw money my way, I'm not too proud to bend over and pick it up while I'm standing here. Just want to let you know that. And as you know, Michael said, I'm, um, I'm some guy that stands around and talks a lot. So give you a little bit of background on who the hell am I and why am I here talking to you. So I spent over 20 years in the mobile industry. I started when it was called bag phones and beepers. If you don't remember a bag phone, you're welcome to get up and leave now because none of this is going to make any sense. Or if you're one of the cool kids, you had the Zach Morris phone. Everybody remember the Zach Morris phone? Everybody remember Zach Morris? All right, good, good. There we go. And I spent a lot of time working on both sides of the developer ecosystem when we're talking about mobile content. I helped launch the developer programs at T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon Wireless, Bell Mobility, Rogers, <clears throat> excuse me, a few other smaller ones. And then I also worked as, a, as an agent who brought content into the, man, or into the uh, wireless operators. So back in the day, there were apps before iPhones, in case anybody was wondering, and people actually made money off of them. And if you were Sprint and you had the, the Sprint store, or you were AT&T and you had the AT&T Media Mall, uh, they didn't work with just everybody. You had to have a direct relationship with them. And most of them had, on the games or app side, between 7 and 12 partnerships. And anybody else who wanted to get a game or an application onto those platforms came through my office. So I've launched over 500 different apps in my life, previous to the automotive industry, and helped build the platforms that they went on to. So I've played around with developers for a while. Back in the day, I worked with Nokia and Sprint on the creation of subscriptions. Uh, at one point, the only, time that you, the only way that you get an application was to download the entire thing. Um, before smartphones, we had a limit of 968K that you could actually have an application in the wrapper and the shell that would work in there. So if you understand anything about technology, that's you know, a couple of text messages it's essentially today. And for anybody who does actual real developing and knows any of that kind of stuff, I'm going to show you that right now that I have no street cred. The only thing I know about development is it starts with one of these and it ends with one of those. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in between that I have no clue what it means. So I tend to surround myself with really smart people or at least smart looking people like my business partner there in, in that picture. And there may have been a few cocktails involved when that was taken, so. Uh, but most recently, my world has been here in the automotive industry. Uh, I started with Ford in 2011, <clears throat> excuse me, as a, as a consultant. And they asked me to come in, and, come in and, and sign agreements with developers for revenue share. And I said, that's really exciting, because none of those words go together in that sentence. So I came in and started talking about a developer program and created the world's first automotive developer program in 2013, um, as was in my wonderful bio. By the way, Michael, you're welcome to come around with me and introduce me everywhere. Yeah, exactly. I love it. <laughs> Uh, and again, we have 25, over 25, we're, we're, we're approaching 30,000 uh, members in our community today, and that's a global community. And we've launched over 200 different apps around the world that connect to the vehicle. And we're expanding this year in 2019, now that we've got modems in the vehicles, we can bring content in directly through the cloud, and we can embed it in the head unit and turn it off and on utilizing the cloud there as well. Also opened up our IP at Ford. Uh, so if you have a Ford, if you have and I know you all do. You've got Sync 3. You've got the ability to connect your applications on your device to your head unit in Sync and use it. We understood that we weren't going to be able to scale as the automotive industry. We sell 82 to 88 million vehicles, brand new vehicles around the world, everybody combined. Samsung sells 88 million devices every single quarter. We don't provide scale to developers as an industry, so we definitely don't do it as one single OEM. So what we did is we took our content, our IP, and we opened it up, created what we call Smart Device Link, or SDL. And we allowed anybody who wanted to use it to have the control over their content, over the content choices in their vehicle, as opposed to letting some guys from Silicon Valley, you might have heard of them. I think one's Apple. The other one, I think they call themselves Google or Alphabet or something like that. They, you know, they're, they're new. They're young. 
Just look them up. I don't know how you're going to look them up if you don't know what Google is, but <laughs> does anybody still have Bing? Does Bing still work? <laughs> okay, you never know. Um, the idea there is that you, you know, use an OEM, you want to have control over this and you want to monetize the stuff that's coming into your vehicle. As we approach autonomous vehicles, the car just becomes a, a, a living room. So you want to be able to, to have control over that and monetize that because just selling a vehicle doesn't make us any money, in case you've looked at Wall Street lately. Um, and I sit on a couple of different boards and chairs across the developer ecosystem, um, simply because I talk a lot and people want me to shut the hell up. So they just, you know, they said, here, go sit here, go talk to these other people that also like to talk and none, none of you are actually listening. And so we all just sit there and we talk about what would be great. Um, so in the history of, of what I've done and, and what I've hopefully I'd like to have done in my mind, uh, I've had a lot of different positions to be able to work with people. And so what I'm really going to talk about today is the understanding of who you are as a person, what you do, and how you interact with other humans around you. I'm not going to get too deep and too esoteric on it, but the idea is basically that science has been changing the way that we understand how the mind works. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions, or not, I don't say misconceptions, but we didn't know. We just simply didn't know. And now bioscience is being able to teach us that we actually can control the way that we think. We can control the way that we react to the world around us, and with, by which means that we can now control the way we react with other human beings, other people. So that means if you're looking to get funded, how do I talk to an investor? If you've got lots of money and you're looking for the right type of people that are going to come in and you're going to be able to work and invest and make money with them, if you're professional services, if you're some guy that makes vehicles and you need to make sure that people want to buy it, how do you interact with the world around you and the people that make up this world? So the illustrative picture that I've got here, and hopefully you guys can see it over there, um, is actually a really, really cool picture. One of the cool things about being at Ford is we have this really cool history. And when we launched the developer program in 2013, the message was, we can't do this alone. We want to surround ourselves with like-minded people. And like-minded people is what Henry Ford did and how he made himself better and smarter. This is a picture of Henry Ford on the left. Guy in the middle you might, you might recognize. He had something to do with light bulbs, like creating them. And the guy on the right is actually President Warren Harding. And you can't quite see him, but there's a little bit of a leg right down here. And that's a gentleman named Firestone that you also may have heard of in the automotive industry. And these guys hung out together. It's always kind of weird to look back and see the juxtaposition of history when you realize that people that you, you know, you've read about, people that you've seen, actually knew each other. And not only did they know each other, they hung out. They had parties together. This is actually from a camping trip. I love that they called it a camping trip. But if you notice, they're all wearing bow ties. Not the kind of camping trip I've ever been on. I guess they had like entourages of like 70 vehicles that would follow them around and set up tents, and that's how they camped. But the idea that these brilliant minds, these great leaders, also surrounded themselves with other brilliant minds and great leaders is something that's been so interesting to me. And so this is kind of the, the piece that I'm going to be talking about as well. So jumping into memory and jumping into the mind and how it works. Historically, we've always thought about memory as a big file system. So you've got this file system in your head, and whether or not you're talking about something really simple like your favorite cartoon character, or he's kind of a cartoon character, or the, your leader, you know, depending on how you look at it, I'm totally not political, so we'll look at it both ways. But if it's a simple thought, a simple memory, you've got a small file, and you just open up that file, and that's where you pull that memory from. Now, if you're doing something a little more complicated, like tearing apart a Mustang GT500 power plant and putting it back together, then you've got a much bigger file. And you're going you're to need that file to pull it out. You've got all kinds of file folders in there. And this is how you have a memory. This is how you have thoughts. This is how you create who you are and how you look at the world. So as you grow older, like a lot of us seem to be doing, that file system just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you look down the hall to find those files from back when you were a child, back when we were jauntist, and then we don't remember that. Why? Because it's way down the hall. All of these other things that I've been dealing with, like trying to get here. Oh my god, is it going to rain tonight? Is it going to freeze? All of these things are taking up space. But what scientists and doctors have been figuring out is that the mind itself isn't just this little file system. What it really is, is a recreation of the memory when it was created. 
So the way that you're doing, the way that the mind works is you've got neural pathways, and neurons are being fired, synapses are, are popping off, and you're building a memory just like you did the day that it happened, or over the process in which you learned it. So if you've got a memory, you're not pulling back into this file. We've act they've actually shown it. They can pull it up on a functional MRI where you're actually creating that memory in your mind. All of the different pieces, all of the different parts of your mind that were firing off at the time that it happened are firing off at the time that you're thinking about it and remembering it. So whether it's something simple or whether it's something complex, if you're pulling it from, let's just say, five different pieces of your mind are working together, or 50, or 100, or 1,000, or 5 million, every single time that you recall that memory, it's happening again. So it starts to build, and you start to build strength, just like you do in your muscles. The pathways become faster. The pathways actually physically become bigger. The actual <coughs> neuron pathways become a little bit bigger, and it's easier to recall because you're building that what would con be considered muscle memory, but mind memory of all of these things happening and recreating that event or that thing that you're trying to remember. So one of the ways that I learned how to start talking or how to start investigating this and comparing this, uh, I grew up as an athlete. I grew up playing baseball and golf at an elite level into, into college. And one of the misconceptions, misconceptions that people have about sports is, you practice and practice and practice, and then it's all muscle memory, and then you don't have to do anything else again. So they believe that somebody who's at, at the batter, or at the plate, let's pretend our, our mindful guy here is at the plate, that you see a pitch, instantly think, how fast is it going? Is it going to be a strike? What type of pitch is it? Can I swing? Can I hit it? Where am I going to hit it? Well, if you take that long, it's already been back to the catcher and out to the pitcher, so it doesn't matter. So you don't see it, and then think about it, and then swing. That's how a lot of people have always believed it. <clears throat> What's actually happening, though, is, is that your brain operates on a storytelling. Your brain is not operating in the now. When you're looking at me, you're hearing me. But what you're doing is you're processing things, and your brain is telling you a story. Because you've sat around, and you've listened to people talk and iterate on for hours and hours, like I seem to be doing, before. So your brain is telling you, this is what this idiot's going to say next. Your brain is telling you he's going to talk about this, or he's going to walk around, or he might drop the microphone, or he might drop his clicker. Uh, whatever's going on, your, your brain is telling you to be prepared for that so that you're not surprised. Now, if we had a lot of time to think about this and I had one guy come running in and screaming and yelling and then run back out, you would all be very surprised at that because your brain was not telling you to be thinking about that, to be prepared for that. You don't see that on a regular basis. So the mind is really telling you stories. It's, it's saying, I've got something going on, and that's called a heuristic. If you're not familiar with heuristics, heuristics are just a, 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 a rule of thumb. The idea that this is probably what's going to happen based on my experience, based on these neuropathy, based on these things that have happened. And you can apply it to any part of your life, not just in the brain. Um, it's actually, if, you, if you're really excited about looking into OEMs, distracted driver and NHTSA, all of their testing on distracted drivers is all based on heuristics. It's all based on, this is what we think people would do. So they're telling you you're not a good driver because that's what they think. Just letting you know. When it works right, we call it intuition. Right? You've got deja vu. You've got that feeling of, I've seen this before. I've, I've had this conversation before. I know what's coming next. Because your brain is telling you, yeah, you have. If your brain believes it. It's telling you that story. When you get it wrong, it's a bias. And it's a bias not in a cultural bias, it's a bias in a systematic bias. Meaning, you don't have the right tools or you made an assumption about the answer before going through the rigor. And if you're into testing and science, that's a big, huge no-no. Now, it does become a cultural bias. That's how the human aspect of it works, is it, it, you can create a cultural bias based on the fact that you've got this systematic bias in your head. So understanding where is it coming from, how am I doing this, can keep you on the intuition side and keep you open to interacting with other people, whether it's asking for an investor, whether it's hiring somebody, whether it's asking somebody for directions on the street. The whole idea of not making the bias of what you think is going to come next, what your brain is telling you is going to come next. And being open to understanding that you can change the way that that thinks is what's going to make you 
a better investor, a better uh, soccer player, a better um, founder, right? Which the most people in the room are. So how do we do stuff like that? Well, when we talk about chunking, and I'll get out of the way so people back here can see, when we talk about the chunking aspect of it, it's what have you learned? This is why people train, this is why people practice, whether you're a singer, whether you're a guitarist, if you're a golfer, if you play baseball, it's those things that lead up to the point of action. So again, you're not gonna see the ball hit the ball, although that's a great saying, and I've had coaches yell at me for years about that. The whole point of it is you're actually taking more information than what you think you're doing, and you're, you're making your decision based off of that. So, I don't wanna bore everybody if you're not into baseball, but the whole idea of chunking before you even ever swing your bat or see the ball come out of the pitcher's hand is you're looking at cues. So this is, about a, this is about a two and a half to four second period of our good friend Justin Verlander, who's unfortunately no longer here. So what a batter is doing, and a lot of times unconsciously, but now that we're learning about the mind much more consciously, is they're looking at the glove. Is the glove held down? Is it at the belt? Is it held up? What does he do differently for different types of pitches? And then when he starts his windup, a lot of pitchers, you'll, always, you'll hear them if you listen to, to TV or, or the radio, they talk about tipping a pitch, right? Is he opening or closing the glove because he's trying to change his hand and his grip on the pitch? Does he do something different with it based on what type of pitch he's throwing? Is his leg pump straight up in the air on a fastball because he wants to get more press, push behind it? Or does he go around his body on a curveball because he's trying to fool you? And then as he's releasing, what is his swing through? Can you see the ball or does he hide the ball? Is his foot coming directly at you? And finally, where is the release point? And what is he doing with his shoulder? What's happening to his belt? These are the things that they start to teach batters. And if the more that you practice it, you build those memories, you build those pathways and rebuild those pathways. When that guy finally lets go of the ball, your mind is already working on what's the story, right? It's telling you that story of what's going to happen in the future. So if you learn in that chunking phase what's actually gonna happen, then more times than not, and unfortunately in baseball, if you do it three times out of 10, you're brilliant, your mind is telling you what's gonna happen, and that's when you swing the bat. Now a lot of us miss more than three times out of 10, unfortunately, but the point of that is this is how the mind is telling you the story. So the more that you can work on it, the more that you can open up to it and say, what is my mind trying to tell me? When I'm, working with this, when I'm working with this other person, when I'm interacting with somebody in my business day, in my personal life, my family, my friends, the people that I talk to in China at seven o'clock at night because it's 7 a.m. there, what, what am I going to make sure that I'm going to look for so that I don't make that biased choice in my interaction with them? So there's other words for chunking and maybe be a little more uh, familiar to you being on a roll, being in a zone, right? There's all kinds of different words for it. And different ways that you can, you can explain and you can express how that's happened to you. The runner's high, right? People talk about runner's high being in the zone. Anybody here a runner? Do you know runner's high? Is that a thing? Never had it. I get so bored running. I get, I, I, I'll just start, stop walking because I, I don't get the runner's high. I try. I really, really do try. But people that have done it said they love, absolutely love it, right? Or if you're a musician, we got musicians around here. What's, you know, think about some of the best times you've ever been jamming, you know, and you just, you get carried away, right? You're not in the moment. You're not thinking about anything. You're not thinking about the next note or a fingering or, you know, whatever the, whatever the position is. You're just in that moment. You're grooving. You're flowing because your mind has gone through it. You've done the practice before. Maybe you've played with these musicians before. All of these things are tying together to where your, your muscle memory is, is now just happening because your mind is telling you, don't worry about it, I got it. You're making that decision without making the decision. There's a fast system of thinking and a slow system of thinking. If you've ever read Mr. Kahneman's book, it's a very, very nice read. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of authors here towards the end. It talks about how your different modes in your mind react and work together, right? Some things are very instant and they're uncontrollable. You, you don't control your heartbeat. You don't have to think about breathing. And a lot of what happens when your brain is telling you this story comes from that quick and that fast system. It's about understanding and recognizing that so that your slower, smarter system can take over and go, no dummy, that isn't what they meant. You need to do something a little bit different. 
And I use the dummy part internally, not, not for anybody out, out here. So now we're going to do the audience particip participation part. <clears throat> this is not going to be rough or tough. And there's no right or wrong answers. What I'm looking for is observations. So I'm going to show you a picture. And I just, just shout out the observations. Again, nothing's right or wrong. Just tell me the observations that you have about the picture. And tell me your observations about this wheelbarrow. Cement wheelbarrow. Unstable. Unstable. It's not sitting on the ground. Not sitting on the ground. Not gonna work. It's gonna fall. Looks like a garbage can. Garbage can. Not a wheelbarrow. Not a wheelbarrow. Michigan. Michigan? <laughs> <laughs> if you see Michigan, again, there's no right or wrong answers, but um, there's some there's some borderline <laughs> answers in there. So here's a few answers. Uh, it's interesting. The handle's short. If you got mud on the wheel, you could kick it off. It'd be easy to empty in a hole because you could wheel it right up to the edge. And what if you had a trap door at the bottom and you could open it with a string? So those replies, those answers, came from a group of eight-year-olds. And if you notice one little difference between their answers, and, and most, and, and again, not all of them, the answers that we give, and, and I've, we all do this, and this is, the answers that we gave on that picture of our preconceived vision of a wheelbarrow were negative. And this isn't a positive or negative thing, it's the idea that it is a precon it's a preconditioned thing because your brain is telling you a story and you guys are busy, Right? You took time out of your day to come here. You took time out of your day to listen to me. You have other things going on. You are a creator. You are a founder. You are a business person. You are a family person. You're living your life. And you, your fast thinking part of your brain is getting you ready to do all of those things and to deal with all of those things. So looking at a picture, you instantly have that. And that's natural. You cannot control that. But what you can do is you can control the reaction to it. Now, this is a real wheelbarrow. This is a wheelbarrow that is used on construction sites to go up the side of a building. And somebody said concrete, so you probably have seen it before. <laughs> so it is, it is an actual real wheelbarrow. But you see the, the difference between, you know, we all as adults, we know how to do things because we've trained, we've practiced. Children don't have that yet. They haven't built those neural pathways into the concrete of their minds, or maybe the concrete mind is just mine. Um, but they haven't, you know, they haven't built those static thought processes. They're open and they're willing to look. And that's some of the things that we want to recapture, right? We're busy. And so our heuristics, our rule of thumb when we looked at that was more towards the bias side. And it was the, you know, the, the, your first reaction, my first reaction was, well, that's not a wheelbarrow because I'm not picking that up to try to carry that, right? You, you know, wheelbarrows are supposed to push forward. How do I pick that up and carry that? But if you can recognize that, if you can find a way to grasp that as you're thinking about, as your fast thinking system is telling you those things, that's how you have the upper hand. And that's how you become a better communicator. That's how you become a better parent, a better husband, wife, girlfriend, a better boss a better accountant, just a better person interacting in the world is to see those things happening as they're starting to form. My interpretation of manager and leader is you manage things, you lead people. And again, that's, everybody's got their own. But this is again, now let's, now let's think about the way that you interact with managers and leaders based on a number of different criteria, like listening. You know, think about listening when you're busy, when you're tired, when you're annoyed, when you just listen to some guy from Ford talk for 20 minutes, which by the way, if I get close to 20 minutes, you better yell because I have no clue. And I just, I just keep going, right? So how do you listen to somebody? And are you actively listening? Are you, waiting to, are you waiting to speak or are you taking in what they're talking about and being able to make a, a thought then? Fast and slow, fast and slow. Triggers, what triggers somebody? What triggers you? Understanding your own triggers. Another quick little one. I've always traveled for my, for my jobs. 
And one of the worst things that you can ever do to me is when I answer the phone, if I answer the phone, is the first thing out of your mouth say, where are you? I've had bosses do that for years, and I finally tied it back, learning my, about myself, was because as a kid, I was always out playing with my friends, and I was always late to get home. Always. And I would set my watch back. <laughs> I don't know. It must have got... So I was always in trouble for not being late, and so, or for being late. So as I became an adult, it was built in that if somebody was going to ask, you know, where are you at, that means I'm in trouble. I've, I've come close to getting over it. I was only married for three years, so I've kind of gotten past it now. You know, your beliefs, and I don't mean beliefs in religion, those obviously have an impact, but beliefs like, for me to win, somebody has to lose. Children are better seen and not heard. Women's place is in the home. Any belief that you have, whether you believe it to be right or wrong compared to others or whether others believe it to be right or wrong is going to impact the way that you view yourself and you view others in the world. Accountability, or from South Park, an accountability buddy. How do you view yourself being accountable? And is it different than how you expect your boss or your employees to be accountable to themselves and to you? Right? And again, this isn't about you should go out and just change everything in the world, but you have to understand this in order to be successful. And change, how do you adapt to change? How do you bring other people through change, right? Manager and leader, are you pitching in? Are you expecting your manager or leader to pitch in? And how do you react to that? So everybody knows what these are, the four squares. You can be an NTS, JR, FCK, 1, 3, or there's tons of them. I'm not going through those because I don't, I don't care. There's lots of them. Uh, one, of the, one of the people I'll cite in here is Sen Delaney, is a company that's very good at it, <clears throat> and I, I like their, their, their system. But the point of it is, this is again one of those things that they, I call this a broadcast message, right? How many people are out there putting this on Facebook and putting it someplace else? I'm an NTSJ, I'm an FRCB, right? It's not about the communication level. They're great, but after your 30 days of taking this class, after 45 days, after 60 days, do you remember what they were telling you? Did you take anything out of it or did you learn, this is what I am. I am an enterprising, creative person who enjoys new challenges because I'm an entrepreneur. But you know what I never see on here? And the Game of Thrones one just threw me. That's why I included it. I've never actually watched the show. But you know what you don't see on here? You don't see the executive who says in a meeting, I'm going to retire in 10 years, so we're not going to change anything, so don't screw it up for me. You don't see... I'm the guy who comes into work half the time uh, and I just read the newspaper because I'm trying to make sure that I get it through because I really don't want to do anything, right? You don't have the one in here that says, well, I'm sick at least three days a week to make sure that I don't actually have to go into the office. So what you've got to do is you've got to learn to deal with those types of people and find and flesh out those people so that you and your organization that you're building can be successful. And they don't tell you how to do this here. So I'll give you a little bit of him. I'll give you a little bit of kick to try to do it. This is the way that, I, this is the way that I, I've looked at life. And this is the way that, um, and when we get to the next slide, you'll, you'll see where it, some of it comes from as well. You are your vision. This is you, right? This is the way you see the world. This is the way you see yourself. You've got your inner circle. And you communicate and you interact with those people a little bit differently than you do the rest of the world. But how are you reacting based on some of those things? Understanding how your, how your mind works in the, in the fast and the slow, is there a way to get the best out of them and to give back the best to them? And then your next circle out are relationships. And I don't mean beneficial as in does it benefit you. I mean these are your family and your friends and your coworkers that are not part of that really tight inner circle. Right? And you interact with them together and you interact with them through your inner circle. How can you figure out ways to understand how do you impact them because they're impacting you. And then there's everybody else in the world. And the world's pretty big from what I've gathered. I've flown around it a few times and it takes a really long time to do that. And that's the hard part to, to grasp and, and I, I'm not going to pretend that I know how to do that. I'm working on it myself to do it and I encourage everybody to work on find ways to think about humanity Two of the greatest minds in the world that have ever existed, Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking, have all, they always talked about how, what they were doing was for humanity. Think about if they were selfish people. 
right? Einstein could have said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to file patents, I'm going to create something cool, and if other people figure it out and I can figure out how to sell it, then I'll make money off of it. Stephen Hawking had no choice but to, he was trapped, literally trapped in his own mind. And he could have said, okay, well, I'm going to sit here and something's going to happen. I don't know what it is. But he worked harder than anybody else because he believed in it for humanity. Right? And, and it's not, we're not all going to reach that kind of a height. Right? We, but the whole point of humanity is it's everybody else. Right? It's people that you haven't met yet. It's people that you don't deal with on an interaction on a daily basis because your mind can create that cultural balance based off of your systematic balance or bias, cultural bias based off of your systematic bias, which means that you could run into somebody on the street who could never end up being a beneficial relationship or your inner circle. So you not only interact with people when you come into contact with them, but you're interacting with them through everybody else. Right? You're interacting with, with everybody through your daily interactions, from your tightest circle all the way out. So you've got your direct and you've got your indirect, and how are you dealing with that? And then just a fun little image is, think of it like a, like a, like a uh, volcano. Right? The more that you can do, the more that you can understand, hey, this is how I work, and this is my energy, this is how I get going, and you bring other people, other like-minded people in there with you, all of a sudden you've got heat and you're building that heat and that starts to affect your inner circle. Now you've become a manager of things and a leader of people. And now it starts to grow. Now there's more heat and there's more disruption going on. And that starts to reach out into the rest of humanity. And then it just explodes. But what happens after it explodes is it comes back to you. So where and how can you do this? This is where people might want to start scoffing at me and that's fine because I did for a very long time myself. Mindfulness, and we've all heard the different terms. Mindfulness, and I call it focusing attention on the present moment and experience. Trying to get your brain, which is telling you stories about the future, to help you deal with the present. And to think about it so that you can have that slow thinking system, that slow acting system take control over the fast reaction. It removes biases and it nurtures intuition. And this is the two sides of the same coin. And science and meditation, you can call meditation religion. I, I don't like to put tags on things. You're welcome to look at it in any, any method that you want because there's no one good way to do any of this, except the science part. <laughs> that, that's pretty well straightforward. But the idea now is there are, there's so much out there where you can actually start to learn this. You can see where these options tie into science and where science proves some of these options that you can do in your own mind. So, wrapping it up, these are some of the authors um, that I suggest. There are a lot of them out there, but these are, these are good authors. Um, Sendelaney is the group that I spoke about that does um, uh, culture change and culture formation. They've been around for a very long time. Uh, they're very, very good, uh, well put together. They're not local. Um, I'm not trying to sell anything by them, but I do, I do believe in them. Daniel Kahneman, many people have heard of, of him, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and Douglas Hofstadter, uh, it's a little bit out there, but if you've ever read, it's called Godel, Escher, and Bach, and it ties together machine learning. Um, Godel, um, which is a mathematics genius from proving that systems can't talk about, or systems can talk about their own systems, way outside of what I know, and Bach and Escher as to how beauty and the mind actually work together, and you can prove science and biology working in the same fashion. So very exciting things. Um, really just the idea that you can control the way that your mind works and this can make you a better person and a better business person for all of your efforts that you're doing here. So I'll leave you with one last thought and that is that you know, from my friends Rick and Morty that I've always told, I did a lot of training for salespeople, a lot of training for managers and one of my main messages is you make your own luck. Right? You have too many people that stand on the front lines like, I didn't work the lucky hours. I didn't get the lucky person to walk in. You make your own luck. And based off of that, the same idea is that your reality is fake. It's up to you to make your reality. Everything around you, you have control over. Every thought you do, every action that you take, until some other massive outside force, like Mr. Hawking, it works on you, you still have control over your mind, though. So take time. Learn some of these options, explore them, don't take my word for them, 
and hopefully that can help you be a successful business person, hopefully be a successful family member, friend, and, and overall just a, a better human being so that when we reach out into humanity and you guys run across me in the, in the ether out there, you don't try to run me down with a car or something like that. Thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>